Great. Well, thank you, Tara. Um, and good afternoon, and thank you everyone for joining us today for this uh, Illinois tax webinar. Uh, today we want to touch on some areas and issues related to Illinois tax that, that we see, you know, many questions and concerns from many taxpayers. I'm Jennifer Edwards. I'm the SALT manager in our Sioux Falls office. Also presenting today will be Laura Robichaud. She's the SALT senior manager in our uh, Phoenix office and Stacey Roberts, our SALT Senior Manager from our Denver office. Oh, Tara, what do I need to do to move the slides? Thank you. So I'll start off the presentation talking about um, some of the requirements and steps for opening and closing a business, basically you know, which um, agencies in the states to be registered with, um, uh, some of the, the forms that need to be filed. Laura then will take us into the wonderful world of sales tax, where she will talk about um, you know, problem areas uh, that we see in sales tax, such as determining what is and isn't taxable, um, sourcing, some uh, rules about that, and some of the unique local taxes that are out there. And then also she will talk about um, some sales and use tax rulings that should be considered if you're doing business in Illinois, you're considering doing those business in Illinois. Stacey then will finish the presentation up um, discussing Illinois uh, income tax topics that are important for businesses. She will talk about uh, doing business or you know, nexus for income tax purposes, uh, combined reporting, apportionment, and uh, pester entities and some of the, the intricacies of those reporting in Illinois. All right, so we'll get started with opening a business. Um, and really this discussion on opening and closing a business in Illinois is really gonna be geared toward out-of-state businesses um, that are making sales or conducting business with uh, customers in Illinois. Um, you know, if, if you are a business that um, you're setting up and having, you know, your operations or you're going to be headquartered in Illinois, many of these same steps. But for the most part, what, how we want to focus on this presentation will be for our out-of-state um, customers or out-of-state retailers that are doing business in the state. So on the screen, or this, our first slide here is just kind of the opening of a business checklist. Um, many of these steps that you've probably seen before, they're gonna be pretty typical um, steps that have to be taken regardless of what state you're, you'd be registering in. Um, first, registering with the Illinois Secretary of State, um, obtaining an authority to transact business um, if, if applicable, um, getting a registered agent, registering with the Illinois Department of Revenue, um, completing the business application, obtaining a certificate of registration, We'll talk about that a little bit more in depth here in a little bit. Um, and there may be some other uh, agencies within the, uh, the government or within Illinois that needs to be um, registered with. So for example, um, if you have employees in, in the state, you need to be registered um, with the, go through the Department of Employment Security to register for unemployment um, insurance. So I just want to circle back with registering with the Secretary of State. Um, that's you know always a step that needs to be considered. Um, generally, businesses that transact or are doing business in Illinois may be required to register with the Illinois um, Secretary of State's office. Now, the Secretary of State, um, if, if you're not sure whether you need to, if you meet those definitions, because the state doesn't really clear, clearly define transacting business or doing business in the state. So a lot of times, uh, retailers or entities may not know whether they actually meet that requirement. Um, calling the Secretary of State's office, they, they won't give you that determination. Um, they'll Generally, it's a legal opinion, and they'll tell you it's, it's really based on what are your activities, and then looking at that with um, analyzing cases and different law, um, Illinois law. So um, if you go through all that and, you, and it is deemed that you have um, – that your activity in the state rises to that level to requiring the registration of the, to, with the Illinois Secretary of State, um, then there are the forms that need to be filed. If you're an out of state or a foreign corporation, and a foreign corporation is just any state that, or any entity that would not be um, registered initially or um, have their uh, be initially registered with in Illinois, 
um, the form is BCA 13.15. And then if it's a, a limited liability company, their registration form is the LLC-45.5. Um, but again, it's really knowing whether you actually have that legal requirement and you meet that definition to have to be required with the uh, Secretary of State. Um, if you are, re you need to have a registered agent. A registered agent um, typically is with any other state. It's an individual or company um, in the state of Illinois that has an Illinois address and that are authorized to act as, a, as an agent in that state. Um, So what the big thing that we really want to talk about would be, you know, when do you register with the Department of Revenue? And when does an out-of-state entity, when do they have that requirement? Uh, the general rule would be if you uh, to register with the Department of Revenue, if you conduct business in Illinois or with Illinois customers. So an entity should register as a retailer if they are doing business in Illinois. And again, doing business is not clearly defined. Um, but there are some I, things we'll go through here in just a minute that kind of um, help define or clarify what doing business or, um, in Illinois would be. Um, um, so if you're doing business and selling tangible personal property at retail in the state. So an entity is considered doing business in Illinois um, if they have a place in Illinois from which you deliver a product um, such as a warehouse. And it could be even, um, you know, having product in a third party warehouse, um, but because your product is in the state and being delivered from that state, there'd be a requirement to be registered with the Department of Revenue. Um, selling tangible personal property in Illinois through at conventions, seminars, fairs, um, even though those seem, you know, are generally um, a very, a, a specific time frame. Um, maybe a short time period, you're not there all the time, but just selling through those types of venues can or will create a requirement to be registered with the, or the Department of Revenue. For out-of-state retailers with contracts with persons located in Illinois, um, if that person uh, in Illinois directly or indirectly refers customers, um, and that can include something as simple as having a link on their, that person's website, and uh, you pay that Illinois person a commission or some other consideration based upon those sales, and the cumulative gross receipts from all the sales made to um, any referred customers exceed $10,000 during the preceding four quarters, uh, that out-of-state retailer would have a requirement to be registered with the Department of Revenue. Um, an entity would be, um, and if you, oh, let me step back. And another for an out-of-state retailer where they would have a requirement uh, to be registered and collect use tax would be if the retailer has a salesperson, let's say, that occasionally goes into the state. And if they have that enough of a connection with the state, they would have to be registered. Um, even if all the salesperson does is solicits orders and all those orders are sent out of the state for acceptance and delivered from outside, without outside, um, outside of the borders of the state, uh, they would still have uh, be enough of a connection to have to be registered with the Department of Revenue. And we are talking about registering as a retailer. If, if your entity is a reseller, so you sell to entities, uh, you know, another business that actually is the, will sell to the end user, so they're re reselling your product, um, you may want to register as a reseller um, and get a reseller certificate if you ever would think that you will be buying any of your uh, materials or product from suppliers in Illinois. Because in order to be able to buy from a supplier in Illinois tax exempt, you have to have a reseller permit. Oh. We skipped one, um, not ready for the polling question quite yet. We skipped the slide, um, there we go, thank you. So now we talked about who needs to register. So what for, what do you have to do to get registered? The um, Illinois Business Registration Application is the REG1. It's typical type of information, um, FEIN, business name, description, when did you start doing business? The, the typical type information, you would submit that. That can be either be submitted electronically or paper filed. 
Um, once that has been submitted and accepted by the state, the state will issue a certificate of registration. Um, that certificate of registration is really your permit to engage and start doing business in the state. Um, and on that certificate of registration, it will let you know your, your Illinois account number will be on there, business name, address, effective date, um, and then also will let you know the date the, that the certificate will expire. For the retailer certificate of registration, those, those permits are good for five years. And unless you're notified by the Department of Revenue, the uh, renewal will be automatic. For a reseller certificate of registration, however, they are only good for three years. And so when it's getting close to that three year um, time period and when it's about to expire, the state will send out a packet, a, re a renewal packet. And uh, that, that um, uh, renewal is not automatic. So you actually have to fill out the application and send it back into the state. All right, so that then takes us to our first polling question. When is a sales tax permit required for doing business in Illinois? You sell a tangible personal property at retail at a convention. You contract with a person in Illinois to have a link on their website. You pay a commission to a person in Illinois based on sales in Illinois or all of the above. All right, looks like we had a good response there. And the answer would be all of the above. I just should have caveated the, the middle two, uh, three, two and three would have been if, if they had more than $10,000 in sales. So, all right. So we'll just quickly go on here and talking about closing of a business. And again, the checklist would be very similar to the steps you would take in most states if you were closing out. If you decide to um, cease doing business in a state and you're, you're registered and you know all along you've been filing and you're doing things, now what do you need to do to get closed out so that you don't continue to get notices or the state's look, state stops looking for um, returns from you and, and such? Um, first of all, any registration or the, any certificate of registrations that you have with the uh, Department of Revenue, they, they need to be destroyed. None of those certificates came, are, are transferable. So even if you're selling your business, the new owner cannot um, operate the business under your certificate of registration. They would have to file their own. Um, in addition to that, any and all tax returns uh, must be filed, whether it's you know, sales tax, income tax, any other type of tax uh, that you may or fees that you're required um, based on the type of uh, industry or product that you sell. They all must be filed. Um, all the final returns must be marked as final. And any and all tax liabilities must be paid in full. Um, if there are still liabilities out there, an account would likely still stay open until that, that time in which it's been closed out. If you have, em have employees in the state and we're um, doing withholding, um, in payroll withholding on that, to close that account out, it's really quite a simple process going out to the Illinois website under the My Tax Illinois. Um, there's a link out there that just says simply request to close account. You click on that and then file the last form um, Illinois 941 and then that should um, start that process of closing out that account. If you were an entity that was um, did get re re registered with the Secretary of State and were reporting and doing annual reports, um, do you need to file an application for withdrawal with Illinois um, to, to close out the account also with the Illinois Secretary of State? And that is an important step if you are registered to, to take, be sure to go through and close that out so that you don't have accounts lingering out there um, and, you know, five, ten years down the road, find out that you um, ha have an issue out there because it, it, can, it can linger. And lastly, then, make sure to notify a registered agent that you're no longer doing business in the state so that they can um, be sure to you know, not continue to file any reports or anything that they would be doing on your behalf. All right, well, thank you very much. And with that, I will turn it over to Laura. 
Okay, thanks, Jennifer. I hope everybody can hear me okay. Um, so what we're gonna talk about next is sales tax. Now I know sales tax is, depending on your industry, is gonna be pretty broad. Um, one thing I kinda wanted to piggyback to what Jennifer had said is that closing out of a state, whether it be Illinois, California, Texas, um, it's probably one of the most important processes. Um, you don't realize how challenging it can be if you go a year or two and you've ceased doing business and then you all of a sudden get a letter from the state of, hey, you didn't file this and um, it's, all, it's very difficult to get out of penalty. So um, using your um, accounting uh, advisor or whoever to help you withdraw from a state um, as soon as you stop doing business is probably like one of the best practices you can have because we have seen it in several occasions where you know, you, somebody just marks up a return final, but they forget to do all of the other steps and it causes a lot of issues and a lot of extra work down the road. So um, what I'm gonna kind of touch on is determining nexus. Now, if you work for a company or perhaps maybe one of you is a bookkeeper uh, where you're, you know, multiple transactions are occurring in different jurisdictions, one of the things that you may notice, especially over the past five years, is that the states have become more aggressive when it comes to determining nexus. Um, and every state is going to have its different statutory requirements of what actually nexus is. I can tell you there are more procedures out there that tell you you have nexus versus the ones that you don't have nexus. Um, it, it's not just one size fits all. So Illinois is kind of unique in the sense where, you know, there's the typical, uh, you have a brick and mortar, you have a person um, or a retailer or someone that is getting paid commissions that lives in Illinois. Perhaps there's a remote employee. Um, maybe they do everything virtually, but maybe they're based out of another office that still would create nexus for sales tax purposes. Um, maybe somebody from your particular area goes into Illinois to do you know, a presentation or a seminar that automatically creates nexus just by, and and it's more of the viewpoint of you're, you're trying to maintain a marketplace. Um, a lot of out-of-state retailers or even manufacturers that are delivering products into, I mean, that can get kind of hairy. Um, if you are a parent company and you have wholly owned subsidiaries or majority owned subsidiaries that may be, or you have a vested interest in a subsidiary that happens to do business in Illinois, um, they are one of the states that says, hey, if they have affiliate nexus. So, oh, you're part of this subsidiary or you're the parent, therefore you have a filing requirement or at least a registration requirement. Um, the one that kind of uh, it seems to catch people a lot is having inventory. So let's say you don't have people um, you don't necessarily have like an office building, but you store inventory in a warehouse or something that's going to a place of distribution that will create nexus because it's considered inventory is also considered property or if you have an asset there. Um, so these are all just kind of things to consider. I mean, I could keep going, but these are the major ones um, when, when we're looking at creating nexus. So uh, one thing I would want to mention is I hear a lot about well, we just have a salesperson there, so that's really the only connection. Well, even salespeople, just the one act of soliciting orders, um, whether they are fulfilled in Illinois or they are not fulfilled in Illinois, can still create nexus. So that's just something to be aware of. Um, if the, for some reason you have a particular situation where you're like, well, we do this, and it seems kind of, it doesn't fit in one of the things I gave an example for, um, you can feel free to reach out to us and We'll, we'll give you, you know, a yes or no answer for that. So understanding what's taxable. Um, gosh, Illinois has a lot of things that are taxable. And, and, and not everything service-wise is taxable, but they do have quite a few services that are taxable. So in this state, the, when they use the term sales tax, what they're actually meaning is like a sales tax that's a combination of, you know, occupational taxes. Um, their occupational or sales taxes are, they impose that on the seller. Um, and then they also, of course, have use tax, like most states do, where they impose that tax on the purchaser. So sellers um, owe the occupation tax to the department. Um, you know, sometimes you can you you can offset it if you accrued use tax. Let me give you a really good example of this. Um, 
let's say you're a company that provides services except you use a contractor to deploy those services so it's not necessarily your FTE or your employee out there it's just a company you contract with that happens to be located in that state number one that creates nexus number two that might be a taxable activity to you even though you're using a third party to um, deploy those types of services so uh, depending on what kind of business you're in it can get kind of tricky um, Interestingly enough, Illinois is one of the states that has a lot of whistleblower cases. Um, there was one pretty large case in Illinois um, where there was no sales tax that was charged on shipping and handling. Well, shipping and handling is unfortunately taxable in this state. So um, Illinois says that you have to charge sales tax on every sale that has shipping and handling, um, whether or not they they give you an option to, um, uh, you know, say you're out of state or whatever the case may be. So if, the, if they're not given the option, the purchaser is not given the option to come and pick up whatever it is that you purchase themselves, or if they don't arrange their own shipping, then sales tax has to be applied. Um, and that includes to like, that includes packaging, labels, containers, whatever the case may be. Um, now, installation, installation charges are taxable if they're not separately contracted or stated. Um, if any of you are bookkeepers, you may be in the habit of separately stating different items on your invoices. That is a really good practice because in 99.9% .9 of the states, anytime you bundle anything, the whole thing's taxable because you can't break it out. Um, so Illinois doesn't charge labor, doesn't charge tax on labor, um, any sort of like data processing or information services or, you know, uh, photography or accounting. But, it, you know, there are a couple other services that they do consider taxable. As of right now, software as a service, so SaaS is not taxable. However, if you download software to a computer or, you know, you download it from the cloud, they're going to say that's taxable. But as of right now, anything that's accessed via the cloud is not taxable. Okay. Um, just to kind of piggy on back on that a little bit, we have um, quite a few times this year kind of worked with different companies to figure out what is the strategic approach to decreasing your sales tax liability. Uh, there is a, a publication, Publication 104, I will mention it a couple of times. This is uh, one of the easier to read publications uh, published by Illinois. It's all the sales tax exemptions. So, you know, sometimes machinery and equipment, but it's not all machinery and equipment. Um, sales to uh, items that are out-of-state buyers or things that are going to be shipped out of state, the usual, anything if for not-for-profit organizations, uh, usually any newspapers or anything like that are not going to be taxable. But in order for, like, let's say you have something on this list, but you don't think it's taxable, um, you also need to make sure to have a certificate of, um, like, an exemption certificate. So I think Jennifer had mentioned this earlier, is that an exemption certificate, you know, it, it's issued by the state. You have a reseller certificate, you have to apply for it. Um, they have to be maintained regularly. Sometimes they can expire. Um, I've seen a lot of times where people just provide a blanket certificate. Well, Illinois may not accept that. First of all, they're not a streamlined state. Second of all, you know, it's, it's subject to whoever the auditor is that looks at it, to whether it's completed um, or executed properly or it was um, maybe it's missing a date or a signature. So, you know, there's a couple of things that aren't taxable, but for, this list is not comprehensive. But, you know, I would suggest looking at the statute or talking to um, if you if you have a sales tax person that you confide in just to make sure that you're not paying sales tax on items that you don't really necessarily need to and then the other side of it is is maybe you're accruing use tax on machinery and equipment that you don't have to because it's exempt in the state okay sourcing um for sales tax there's sourcing for income tax there's sourcing and stacy's going to talk about income tax sourcing in a couple of slides but for sales tax, there's what we call origin-based or destination-based. And Illinois is an origin-based state. So origin-based states 
mean that wherever the tax rate is going to depend on the location, um, as in shipping from, not shipping to. So for example, if I have a business and it's located in Chicago, um, then my sales tax rate, if I'm shipping like, I don't know, pens and pencils um, to another place within the state, it's gonna be based off my Chicago rate, even if I'm shipping something to the smallest town like Valley City or something. Um, there's a couple of different uh, acts that have been passed, you know, trying to create some sort of standardization because this is a huge issue across remote sellers, you know, determining the the right tax rate. And if you're a small or medium business, you probably spend a ton of time determining what's the right rate. I'm sure Google is used quite often. Um, so there's the Marketplace Fairness Act, there's the Remote Transactions uh, Parity Act, and then there's Online Sales Simplification Act. Now, of those three, um, and you probably have heard of maybe one or two, you know, not all the states have executed things from a statutory viewpoint that follow all of these rules and regulations. Um, determining whether you're charging the right tax rate is half the battle, and then the other half of the battle is remitting it to the state. So this is where a lot of people get tripped up in, in sales tax audits. So there could be a rate change, you could be charging, you could be located in a state that's a ship to, uh, not a ship from, and um, you've been collecting the tax, wrong tax rate all along, and now you're subject to audit because you're not correcting, you're not collecting the right amount. Um, one of the best solutions if you're one of these types of customers is, um, creating some sort of automation. Uh, we've seen a lot of increases, especially in the software application industry where more and more companies are trying to execute or they're trying to buy into getting some sort of automated software program to help handle these multiple jurisdictions because they are pretty serious. Just to give you an example, if you're, if you're charging 1% less than what you're supposed to be, and you did maybe $5 million in this one state, I mean, that that alone would be in a material amount in any audit situation. So we always kind of recommend that if you, if you have the means or you're thinking about growing or you're gonna start expanding in Illinois, any other state, um, you're gonna wanna look at sourcing and you're gonna wanna look at, okay, how do we do the, the right tax rate and then, um, what happens if, you know, there's a, a certain type of shipping situation or if you do drop shipment. So just something to consider the ship to and the ship from. Those are really big um, differences. Um, one thing that I'll kind of touch base on really quickly before I start talking about the local taxes is right now um, there's several states that require a remote seller uh, reporting requirement. Now, as of right now, this state does not have one. It does not mean that in the future they won't have one. So what that means is if you're a company that sh ships in stuff, call it tangible personal property into Illinois, and you're, you're, you're saying, we don't have a presence there, we're not required to collect, we're not required to charge sales tax or collect sales tax, then at some point, you're going to probably need to report that to the state. As of right now, it's not a requirement, but it it it's becoming a growing trend. So I wouldn't be surprised if Illinois hops on that bandwagon soon. So unique local taxes. Um, I just put a whole bunch of them on this the slides. So you can kind of see like there's taxes everywhere. Uh, but pretty much, if you've do, done business in any of the states on the East Coast, West Coast, Middle of America there's gonna be all these weird local taxes. There's always a local rate that's state, county, city. Um, so the three layers to the onion. What I would kind of caveat to everyone is that if you start doing business in Illinois, you need to probably make sure that you get a license at that local level. Um, interestingly enough, so let's say um, you, you're going to Bloomington and you're gonna you're gonna create Nexus there. You're gonna do business there. Well, Bloomington's website actually says that you need to have a business license, and by the way, you need to apply in person. Which I don't know if that's even reasonable, but um, you have to get a business license, and that's where a lot of the companies don't realize that 
there's a, a, a gaping hole there. So you may get licensed with the state, you may, you know, payroll and all that, but then you forgot to do the local business tax licenses and they will get you because they'll go back to the beginning of time. So just to kind of be aware of that. And then also all the different taxes that I have listed here. I mean, these are all subject to change. So if the, if the Bloomington business district tax fluctuates, then you need to be aware of that. So just to keep in mind, the whole point is not to go through all of these, just to let you know, these are all out here. Um, and you kind of have to keep track of the fluctuations in tax rates because they happen all the time. Okay, important documents. So like most states, you can file everything online, but if you're a paper person, um, you're gonna wanna make sure that you're familiar with these types of documents. So the first two are just like the sales tax ones. If you have, um, you would use them if you have, um, you know, like one location, it kind of captures all the multiple city taxes that I showed you on the prior screen. The ST2 is if you have more than one location. So you have a location in Bloomington, you have a location in Chicago, you got a location in Valley City. That's when you're going to use that form. Um, and then, then, of course, there's the amended version of that. And then back in 2015, Illinois published um, Publication 104, which again is, I'll mention this, the common sales tax exemption. So if you want to look at it, um, it's only eight pages, so it's not going to take up a ton of time. But if you're filing there and you're looking for ways to decrease your tax liability strategically, you may want to refer to that document. Okay, so filing a late return. Now, these penalties are not nearly as aggressive as let's say like Washington or California but um, you know what they say is there's two tiers if you file a return late in Illinois uh, the first one is you know going to be two percent um, or the lesser two two hundred fifty dollars or two percent whichever one's lesser um, and then if you hit 30 days then you automatically get bumped up to tier two um, so if you don't file your return within 30 days they're going to impose um, a higher penalty on you. And then of course that just compounds every quarter and then it just keeps rolling. So just to be aware, I mean, not that it happens often, but if you file late, you're gonna get, you're gonna get penalized and that's, nobody wants to deal with that. Okay, so really quickly, um, Illinois has a False Claims Act. They're a false claims act state. There's about nine of them in the U.S. Um, and what this is is for um, whistleblowers. Uh, so pretty much anybody um, can bring a false claim against a retailer on behalf of the state is what that it means. So for example, in Illinois, 80% um, of the cases were, let me back up. 80% of the cases um, were found not including sales and use tax on shipping and handling, um, and they got caught. So out-of-state retailers shipping merchandise into these states, um, you have to be really careful because technically you're supposed to charge sales tax if they de determine you have nexus. They're going to really penalize people for this. So you probably have never heard of this. Let me give you an example. As a consumer, I purchase something from your company. I'm located in Illinois. I notice on my receipt that you haven't charged me any sales tax on something that should have been charged sales tax. Well, I'm, I could go to the state and say, hey, this is wrong. Um, and the state will come after you. So, and, and there are some protections about this and I don't want to get into all the legalities, but uh, there is an example of a whistleblower that occurred in Chicago and they, in, I, I can't remember the period of time, but there's about 900 actions that were brought by this one whistleblower. And that, those 900 actions or claims resulted in over $30 million. So that's probably, who knows if it was one person or one entity that came after multiple retailers, but that was huge for the state to get that kind of money. I mean, $30 million in, a, in settlements is humongous. So you know, whether you're big or small, you can still be targeted. So that's why compliance in the state is really, really important um, and just something to kind of be aware of. 
Okay, let's do a polling question. Okay, which of the following invoice items would be considered taxable? Computer services, shipping and handling, software, transportation charges, or all of the above? Okay, good, we got all of the above. Looks like everyone got that one for the most part pretty correct, yeah. So this, and again, not all services are gonna be taxable, but a lot of them are in this state for some reason. Okay, there we go. So I'm just gonna talk about two cases um, before I hand this over to Stacy. One of them is software as a service. So we have a lot of companies that are, you know, branching out digitally. Maybe they have a brick and mortar in one state. Like, for example, I'm in sunny Arizona, um, but they're going to start offering, you know, an app or something like that to their um, customers or clients. So in this particular, this actually happened uh, late last year. There was a, a, a company, um, an MLM, which is a multi-level uh, distributor. Uh, there's a ton of them out there and they're growing, especially with the popularity of online shopping. Um, and so this company, uh, which was considered an MLM, they're, they're starting to offer like an app, an app where people can go online and order using their independent contractor. Well, the MLM was, you know, they were trying to be proactive, so they sent a letter into the state, which everybody can do for free. I mean, well, maybe not for free, but you can send it into the state, and they'll get based off the facts that you provide, they can give you a ruling for it. It's called a private letter ruling. So in this case, this is what this company did, and they said, hey, we're going to have, we're going to bundle our services, we're going to have a new mobile app, and we're going to have monthly user access fees. Tell us which ones are taxable. So <laughs> Illinois came back and said, you know, dep depending on how it's structured and billed, some of those services aren't going to be taxable. Um, as of right now, as long as anything that's accessed via the cloud, um, it's not going to be taxable. They're not subject to tax. Uh, one of the things is, is that if and everything separately stated, it should not be taxable. Um, one of the things, and this may be something if you are an MLM or you're thinking about turning or you have a branch or something that's an MLM and your business functions that way, um, mostly every state has some sort of agency agreement. In Illinois, there's this called the RR-80. And what that is, is you basically say, we are going to collect tax on behalf of our independent distributors. And you just submit it to the state but in order to do an agency agreement you know you have to fill out a form or write a letter you have to be approved for it um, and then they expect you to start remitting tax um, at all the different levels state county and city so um, kind of just some one thing to be aware of is that this not this doesn't a one size fits all but it is something I've definitely seen it happen a lot in Arizona and Idaho um, some of these MLMs that if you can get into an agency agreement where it's just easier for you to collect the to collect the sales tax on behalf of your independent contractors then do it that way um, it's a little bit more difficult when you have independent contractors out in the field and you are requiring them to collect their own sales tax. Um, that can get really messy because you as the parent or whoever's in charge of the independent contractors, you have to keep track of all that paperwork. Do they have an up-to-date license? Um, are they remitting everything timely? Um, you know, do, is everything reconciling because it all kind of flows up. So it's just easier if, if you fit this kind of situation to um, collect on their behalf. But I mean, I bring up software as a service just because this is, there's a lot of legislation pending 
not only in Illinois, but multiple states regarding this type of um, activity. And so it's just something to keep an eye on if this fits your business model. Uh, the, the last thing is uh, warranties. So uh, I feel like we're kind of, I don't want to cut into Stacy's time, but uh, pretty much the, this company, which was a very popular software company or manufacturer of electronic products, aka computers, tablets, smartphones, they were offering like a product upgrade. Um, and part of that product upgrade is uh, like you extend your warranty. This may sound very familiar to some of you guys. So warranty is a really unique, um, what Illinois pretty much said is that the taxability of any type of maintenance agreement um, is gonna depend on whether the agreement includes the selling price of the tangible personal property. So if your maintenance agreement is $1, but your tangible personal property that you're selling, like a cell phone, is $500, well, that doesn't seem very equal. The state kind of looked at it from the sense of, um, is it comparable? Is it separately stated? Can you buy just the warranty, or do you actually have to buy the phone or the tablet with the warranty? Is it optional? Is it required? Um, so what they found is that the extended warranty was not subject to their um, their tax, um, even though technically, you know, they, they could have taxed it, um, but it, based on the circumstances of this particular case, they decided that it was not taxable. So again, I just wanted to bring it up. This goes all back to if you are a company or someone that's, or a company that sells tangible personal property, um, and you're you're doing warranties in tandem with that uh, retail transaction. Um, you're going to want to look at is is this optional warranty going to be taxable in the state? If yes, great. If not, uh, let's make sure we have all the right paperwork. Um, so these are two kind of like success cases. Um, there are plenty of other ones where the state did not find in favor of the the taxpayer they found in favor of the state. So um, with that, I'll kind of hand this over to Stacy, who's going to talk about doing business in Illinois and then some income tax. Thanks, Laura. Okay, so yeah, so I'm going to move into doing business from an income tax perspective. So most of you are aware from Laura's um, presentation on the sales tax side that if you have a physical presence in the state, that would create nexus for sales tax, clearly. Well, the same would be true for income tax. Also, though, Illinois has a pretty broadly defined doing business standard for income tax purposes, which basically means that Illinois will impose their corporate income tax on corporations for the privilege of earning or receiving income in the state. So even though you may have a physical presence for sales tax purposes, you would have nexus and you'd have nexus for income tax purposes as well with that physical presence. However, you may not have nexus for sales tax purpose, purposes without a physical presence, but you could be receiving income from the state and therefore have, it, have nexus for income tax purposes. Um, however, Illinois does follow Public Law 6272. So for those of you who are familiar with that concept, just as a reminder, if you're selling tangible personal property, so and the solicitation of that tangible personal property is occurring in the state of Illinois, uh, and those orders are shipped from outside and approved from outside of Illinois, and those orders are going into uh, two customers in Illinois, then those sales could be protected. However, as most of you know, Public Law 6272 is limited to sales of tangible personal property, it does not apply to services, it does not apply to intangibles. So um, just be aware that uh, it is a very limited exception. However, Illinois does follow it. Um, and then um, going forward, so for pastor entities, same same thing. So we, we know for, for uh, C-Corps that we, we can be earning income in the state and therefore have nexus for income tax purposes, and the same would be true for pastor entities. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about this in a little bit, but um, pastor entities have to file returns, um, and they also are subject to a personal property replacement tax. Like I said, I will talk about that in a moment. Oh, and we're moving on to a quick polling question. So, 
does the state of Illinois follow public law 6272 or not? True or false? They do follow public life 6272. <laughs> okay. Moving along here. I think. Okay. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the Illinois income tax, but before I do that, I'm going to talk about um, some legislative changes that were enacted in 17. Most of you probably are aware that most of the states have been in budget, um, issue, have had budget issues over time, and Illinois is certainly no exception. In fact, they were in a bit of a crisis and have been in a bit of a crisis. And so there was a Senate bill that was signed July 6th of 2017. And in it, there were some very, there were a lot of legislative changes that were enacted with this bill. And I'm just gonna, I'm gonna highlight some of these just in case you're not aware of them. But um, the personal income tax rate was increased from 3.75% to 4.95%. And then the corporate income tax rate was increased from 5.25% to 7%. Um, so that means that the combined income and replacement tax is 9.5%. And again, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about the replacement tax, but I don't want anybody to forget that it's, it's still around, it's still there, and th those rates have not changed. Uh, the R&D credit, there was uh, a lot of uh, scuttle about whether that was going to be reinstated or not, and it was reinstated, and it was actually retroactive to 16, um, and then it will go through uh, 2021. And then um, they are not conforming to Section 199, so there will be an add back required for that, and that's effective in 2017, or 2018, rather. And... Um, from, from a unitary group perspective, which I will talk a little bit more about what that means too, um, this Senate bill, they expand the definition of what United States means, and then uh, there are some differences now with uh, who can be combined in the, in the unitary business group or not. Um, what's interesting about the definition for United States, um, they now say that it will include members that are operating in any area over which the U.S. has asserted jurisdiction or claimed exclusive rights with respect to exploration of natural resources. So basically what that means is the outer continental shelf. And so if you think about it, what that means really is that before those types of members may have been operating in what we would call international waters and therefore not necessarily pulled into a unitary group for Illinois purposes or maybe any other state that would have um, a unitary group or a unitary rules, um, but they would now be part of, or potentially part of the Illinois group now based upon that expanded definition. Um, I will mention on the non-combination rule for um, the, the unitary business group. So there was a point in time up, in, up until this Senate bill where other types of uh, entities that were in different industries, so for example, financial institutions, because they were subject to different apportionment methods, they would not be able to be part of a regular C-Corp unitary business group, and so they'd have to file separately. Well, that rule has been repealed except for, except for, for insurance companies. So insurance companies still have this non-combination rule. Um, there were some modifications to exemptions, credits, and incentives. I, I mentioned the R&D credit, um, and then they also expanded, <clears throat> excuse me, the manufacturing exemption. So those are just some of the highlights of those changes, uh, but I think it's important to understand that um, these changes have gone into effect, like I said, with the rate changes. Those were effective July 1st of 2017. Um, so here on this slide, we've got now this corporate income tax rate at 7%. Effective July 1st. Uh, does not affect S Corp, just so that everybody's um, aware of that. Now, you may have in court, you may have um, had to deal with some of this, these issues with estimates in the straddle period because we had a situation where this rate became effective July 1st. It's not as if it was retroactive to January 1st or became effective January 1st of this year. 
So there, they had some, uh, they provided some guidance on what to do for estimates when you had maybe a, needed to use a blended rate, for example. Uh, and then there were some issues with short year or fiscal filers uh, that could have been affected by that rate difference. So I, I know that this is from in the past, but I just mention it in case anybody on this call may get notices and you may wonder why you got that notice. It could be something related to the rate and the fact that, you know, the, the taxes or the, the payments that were made were not maybe what the state was uh, expecting. Um, again, I mentioned the replacement tax. It is um, the same rate. It's still imposed on corporations. That rate remains unchanged at two and a half. <clears throat> Excuse me, flow throughs are subject to the uh, replacement tax at one and a half. These, this replacement tax is exactly what it sounds like. It's a personal property replacement tax. This went into uh, effect years ago when Illinois did away with its personal property tax. And so it instituted this replacement tax that is a rate that's in addition to the corporate or, or the corporate income tax or the individual income tax, depending upon what type of a taxpayer you are. Uh, but they're entity level taxes and they're based on net income. So it's not as if those replacement tax, the replacement tax base is gross receipts, for example. It is the net income base. Okay, with that, we're gonna to move to another polling question. So, what is the current combined corporate income tax rate in Illinois? 2.5%, 5.25%, 7%, or 9.5%? Most everybody got it. We got over half at nine and a half because that would include both the, the corporate income tax plus the replacement tax. Okay. So I'm going to touch a little bit on combined reporting, and I mentioned this a little while ago about you know the unitary group structure and the fact that Illinois is a mandatory combined reporting state. So when you have an affiliated group of corporations, you are required to file a combined return if you have a unitary group of entities. It is a mandatory water's edge return, so therefore you're not including foreign entities. There is no worldwide mechanism uh, to file or to file on a worldwide basis in Illinois. It is water's edge. Now, a unitary business group uh, is defined, and it's defined by lots of different states that um, have such a concept. Uh, for Illinois, it means a group of taxpayers related through common ownership whose business activities are integrated with, dependent upon, and contribute to each other, which what does that mean, right? And Illinois' rules are very similar to California's, quite honestly, in this, in this, uh, in this uh, with unitary. Uh, but just to give you a flavor for what some of the rules might be or some of the factors that uh, the state would look at for determining a unitary group, basically, if you have members of a group that are, you know, steps in a vertical process. So if you have a manufacturing process, for example, then that would tend to tend to lend itself to a unitary group. If there's operational control, if you have common overhead, meaning that you may have a, a corporate parent that, you know, provides all the legal, accounting, finance, HR, et cetera, for the rest of the group. If you have common policies, whether that's 401k, benefits, et cetera, common marketing, same accounting systems, common purchasing. Those are just some examples. Um, when, you're, when you're looking at a unitary group, it, it's not something that's usually bright. There's not usually some kind of bright line test here. Uh, there's lots of case law in this area. Illinois is no exception to the fact that they have a lot of case law with determining who is part of a unitary group or not. Uh, but I would just say that if you're looking at a situation where you may or may not be unitary, um, you, you're not going to come away probably with um, a, a very distinct or definite answer necessarily, you may have a lot of situations where you have factors for and factors against. And so, um, like I said, it's a very fact and circumstances uh, test. So just be aware of that if you're struggling to figure out whether you are unitary. 
Um, as I mentioned, it is a water's edge group. Um, it does not include 80-20 companies or foreign companies, as I mentioned. However, uh, do keep in mind that they did expand that definition of U.S., and so you may have a situation now, uh, starting in 2018, where you need to include other entities that you might not have before. From an apportionment standpoint, uh, Illinois is a single sales factor. Uh, generally speaking, tangible personal property is sourced to destination. They do have a throwback rule. So if you're shipping from Illinois and you're shipping to a and shipping from Illinois and you're shipping to a jurisdiction in which you're not taxable, or you're shipping to or the purchaser's the U.S. government, then that would come back to Illinois. Um, also, what's interesting is that Illinois has a double throwback rule. So you could have a situation where if a salesperson who, let's say that they took an order or they generated an order from their office in Illinois, and they sh that order was shipped out of Indiana. So that inventory was sitting in Indiana, and our taxpayer does not have Nexus in Indiana. And then that item that was shipped out of Indiana went to a customer in Missouri. We don't have Nexus in Missouri. We're not taxable in Missouri. That sale would actually go back to Illinois. So it's a little different. Um, not every state has a double throwback rule, but they do. For sales of services, they are technically a market state. Um, however, they're not um, maybe what you would think of as a traditional market state from the standpoint that I think we, we talk more about where the benefit of the service is received for market states. They don't use that language. However, it's primarily the same thing because if the services are received by a customer in the state, then those would be sourced to Illinois. Um, in the case of an individual, in the case of a business that's uh, receiving those services, then they would be sourced to Illinois if the business was, if those services were provided at the business's fixed place, and that business was actually in Illinois. But if that's not determinable, then it would be sourced to where the services were ordered in the regular place, in the regular course of business. If you can't determine that, then it would be sourced to billing address. Okay, and a quick note on pass-through entities. Um, I've said this before, but do not forget that they are subject to the one and a half replacement tax. Uh, so that is an entity level tax, again, based on net income. They, Illinois also does impose non-resident withholding. There was a time up and through, I think it was through the end of 14, where they did allow composites. They did away with composites. So now they require non-resident withholding. And that withholding is on everybody. So if you have a tiered structure, you're going to need to withhold at the lowest level because partnerships are subject to it, corporations, individuals, trusts, et cetera. So if you're wondering where you, you may need to withhold in a tiered structure, it would be at your lowest level. And then it would flow up through on the K-1s that um, move up through the, through the structure. And then don't forget our rate increases uh, for in, for non-resident partner for non-resident individuals rather um, are, they went from 3.75 to 4.95. So if you if you're wondering what you need to withhold on what rate for 2018, it's going to be at the 4.95. And that brings us to our last polling question. So Illinois imposes which taxes on past entities? The replacement tax at one and a half percent, non-resident withholding tax, all of the above, or none of the above. It's all of the above. So most everybody got that one correct. So that was our last slide, um, and I know we're at the top of the hour, a little bit over, so um, I'm going to throw it back to Tara, but on behalf of myself, Laura, and Jennifer, we appreciate everybody's time today, and at this point, I guess we'll open it up for questions if we have any. Wonderful. Thank you, Stacy.